Hello, everyone. Hello. Hey, guys. Hey, Josh. You made it. Okay. You did. I don't, my internet connection is unstable, or so it, uh, Zoom keeps telling me. So I don't know if I'll uh, be able to actually add video here. But no, I, there's, a, there's a very uh, attractive static picture of you. Yeah. <laughs> Mine's unstable too, so, you know, we make quite the pair. <laughs> Indeed. We make do, we make do. How is everyone? <laughs> We're good. Thank you for joining us so last minute. Ah, you can never say no. Never say no to a metro thing. Yeah, <laughs> if, if the Superman's involved, you're never going to say no. It's, it's, this is a true statement. It's <laughs> a true statement. That's why we love you. Aw. You can't see it, but I'm shedding a single manly tear. <laughs> <laughs> My husband's singing this song from Supernatural, the music called the Single Man Tear Song for any Supernatural fans. <laughs> All, right. All right, so um, let's start this off. Josh, do you want to give us a little short bio about yourself? I'm sure everyone knows, but... Uh, well, sure. So... Uh... You know, my, my secret origin is that I grew up in uh, Southern Illinois, uh, just actually a couple uh, hours away from Metropolis, uh, and had, you know, comics were my life. Uh, they, I learned how to read and how to love reading using comics, and that really transformed my entire existence, uh, opened up everything to me. Uh, made reading easy, made reading fun, and when reading is easy and fun, learning is easy and fun. And um, by the time I was in the fifth grade, I was reading at the college level. Um, by the time I was in middle school, I was actually taking college courses. So I just took the SAT and I got scored high enough to get in. Um, I've been a huge disappointment to everyone ever since, uh, but uh, I, you know, peaked yeah, early, but... peaked early. But uh, went on to uh, get a film degree from Northwestern University. And uh, while I was in college, I interned at DC Comics uh, in the editorial department and the publicity department. I interned twice. And uh, then later, as I believe all of you know, went on to write uh, a whole bunch of uh, kids material for DC, uh, do a number of uh, pieces for their animated lines, as well as the um, anthology series, uh, including Adventures of Superman, uh, a story that I'm very proud of that got a write up in USA Today and uh, has was a very special story to me that I'm certainly happy to talk about. Uh, I also created my own uh, nationally syndicated comic strip and graphic novel series called Mail Order Ninja. Uh, and and the founder of a group called Reading with Pictures that promotes the use of comics and education. We are partnered with uh, UNICEF on an endeavor called Comics United Nations that uses comics to promote the UN's global goals for sustainable development. And last but not least, I am the um, comics ambassador for the US State Department. They've sent me to um, five different countries on four different continents. And uh, it's been a real honor talking about comics spreading evangelizing for the medium and uh, sharing uh, ways that they can be used in the, uh, in the classroom. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much my life story there. Uh, and uh, so yeah, I'm happy to answer any and all questions related to that or anything else that you may want to know. I am, I am here for you. <laughs> hey, Sean. Such a disappointment, Josh. Such a... <laughs> <laughs> That's an amazing resume. <laughs> Steve, did you have a question? Um, at the moment, nothing's coming to mind. Um, uh, no, I'll, I'll think of something, though. All right. Well, Josh, you want to tell us more about your Superman story to start? Sure. 
Um, for those of you who haven't seen it or read it, it is available on uh, Kindle and Comixology, and I believe pretty much everywhere that that DC sells digital material. It's also available now in a trade paperback as well. Uh, they collected all of the Adventures of Superman run, which I highly recommend. I think it's, you know, uh, page for page, uh, just about the best uh, Superman stories of the last 10 years. And obviously I'm biased in that regard, but you're going to find some amazing, amazing comics in there. Just, you know, great little one-offs taking the idea of Superman very seriously and sometimes not seriously at all, but, um, and, but always making great stories out of it. So highly recommend all of those, uh, all of those trades. So the story that uh, I wrote was called Dear Superman. And I originally scripted, it was the first comic I ever actually scripted. So I had um, gone to school for, I did a lot of journalism in school. And I'd also gone to, uh, my degree was in film, so I actually did screenwriting. That was like my, my, my main focus was creative writing and professional writing across a number of domains and disciplines. And the very first, my very first attempt at writing a comic script um, was this Dear Superman story. And it came out of my desire to try and tell a story with Superman that I could give to any anyone, you know, no matter who they were, they didn't have to uh, know or love the character like I did. Uh, I mean, everybody has sort of a cultural understanding of Superman. There's you, you're not going to meet anyone that doesn't know what the S stands for. Um, but there, the character sort of exists, right? He's a meme to most people, and that's fine. But I wanted to be able to give a story to anyone and say, this is what, this is why Superman matters, right? This is what the character is really all about. And in just a few pages, make them feel something, uh, make them feel the way that Superman made me feel. Um, and so the way that I did that was uh, going into drawing from my own life where uh, when I was nine years old, uh, yeah. my mother uh, was diagnosed with cancer and had to have a series of surgeries. And, you know, she's made it through. She's doing great. Uh, my, my mom's pretty much the toughest woman I know. I'm pretty sure she'd get hit by a truck and she'd like pop up and ask the driver if he was okay. Uh, but... Um, I'm an only child and she was a single parent. And so it really fell to me to sort of take care of her uh, when she was convalescing after her surgery. And that's a lot to put on a kid, you know. Um, and at that same time, you know, here was this person who was everything to me and was always there for me and um, protected me. And all of a sudden she was laid low and there wasn't anything I could do about it. It wasn't my fault, obviously, but also there wasn't anything I could really do about it. And that's, again, it wasn't my fault. And it was in a sense foolish to put the blame on myself. But when you're young, and I would argue kind of when you're any age, you still feel that way, right? You feel that guilt, why can't I do something? And I wanted to put that feeling into the context of a Superman story because Superman is strength. If anyone should just be able to do something about any problem, it's Superman. And yet this is the kind of problem that's orthogonal to Superman's power. This isn't something that he can just fix. Uh, there is no not even in the Silver Age did, was there like a, a you know, super cancer uh, zapping vision, like that didn't exist. And so it became this story of Superman imparting this wisdom that it's not your fault. And there's still, but there's still something you can do. You can still be there for someone. And in this story, 
this little girl writes a letter to Superman and she's named and in the story she was eventually drawn to look like my mother at that age. Uh, she writes a letter to Superman uh, and this the letter is an overlay to a fight that Superman's having uh, with uh, in the final version of the story. He went through a few iterations, but the final version of the story is fighting Metallo and in the middle of Metropolis. And this little girl, Connie, is there with her family. And, um, you know, we're on Zoom. I could probably just screen share it. Why don't I do that? Yeah, go for it. I'm going to open it up. Give me a second here. And with that, you just displayed more uh, Palace than I have, so <laughs> kudos. Well, I'm uh, I'm on Zoom for multiple hours a day, every day now. So I I would hope I my Zoom foo is strong. <laughs> Thank you for coming on for something like this. <laughs> oh, no. You're already probably zoomed out. Uh, it all blurs together after a while. It's all good. <laughs> hey, guys. Sorry about that. I'm taking care of some stuff here at the house at the same time. But, Josh, it's good hearing your voice again. It's been a little bit since uh, last time we talked. Yeah, indeed it has, sir. But always good to uh, hear and see you as well, my friend. Very good. I will be right back. So, uh, i you know, one of the things we've always talked about is how you got into comics and the character himself, because by the time you came along as a comics, or the age most people were comics readers, um, mm -hmm. there was no newsstand to speak of. Yeah. Uh, how did you get into uh, comics and the character? Sure. And I'll get back to the story, and then I'll get back to the story, and um, the host and i don't know if that's um sean you sean or or kelly uh has disabled uh screen sharing so you'll need to turn that back on for me to me share the comic for you. so uh, i got into comics because they were not easy to find you know lived in a small town in the middle of nowhere and there still was like a spinner rack at uh, the local pharmacy and you could find a few comics on a uh on the magazine stand at like the gas station or, or walmart but that was about it uh you know this is the mid 80s late 80s when i started reading comics but i got into them so much right like i became such a huge super fan uh, that I would basically track down everything that I could find in my town. You know, if, if we had it, then I would have bought it. And uh, eventually my mom sort of cut me off. So I was buying too many comics and, you know, we, uh, again, sort of a, a low income family. And she's like, you either need to get a job or you need to stop buying so many comics. The assumption that she was, of course, going to make was that, I would stop buying so many comics. And I said, well, me being nine years old and given the rather stringent child labor laws in the state of Illinois, what kind of job can I get? Uh, and so I started mowing lawns and, uh, and that actually became a you know, pretty tidy business for me by the time I was in high school, uh, bought my family's first computer uh, and you know, financed a trip to Washington, DC and all this other stuff. But mostly I bought comics and, uh, <laughs> two of my very best friends i actually used to measure everything that i would purchase in terms of how many comics it would buy and that was my my metric uh very useful learn a lot about the fungibility of money uh so all right let's try a screen share now here we go all right is everybody seeing Yes, I do see it. Of Superman. Uh, yeah. Magnificent. All right. So this is a uh, Victor Ibanez did the art, uh, the cover 
is by uh, Sean Galloway, Cheeks Galloway, uh, who did one of the other stories in this particular issue. And and so, you know, the story opens, Superman's fighting Metallo and Metropolis, and you can see there at the bottom right, that's Connie and her family. And, you know, very st straightforward kind of Superman fight. Uh, bad guy doing bad guy stuff. Superman shows up. He's in charge of the situation. He's laying down the law. He's going to do what Superman does. And we get her story coming through in this letter. And, and we capture kind of her voice and her enthusiasm and her love of Superman. And Metallo, of course, uh, is the man with the kryptonite heart. So he's using a kryptonite weapon, but, you know, Superman can dodge it. Superman's not, again, Superman's control. There's very, very few villains that can straight up get one over on. Uh, yes. Did, did someone say? Oh, I said bless you. My wife sneezed. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> No worries. Um, and then the script flips a little where Metallo realizes he doesn't actually have to hit Superman. Uh, he can attack the other, some of these bystanders, Superman being Superman will step up to save the day. And, you know, again, laying all over all of this is this uh the girl's letter which is full of like fun cute stuff like um you know how she has all the superman merch and her favorites her superman piggy bank oinko she calls him oinko the super pig which by the way is a thing that now exists did not exist uh when i wrote this story but one does exist now and uh, i don't know if they call him oinko they should um that's amazing though and, they got the and then we to make them pay your <laughs> I, well, I own the piggy bank, so I, I figured that's good enough. I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Superman takes the hit uh, and saves the family. And, you know, it's pretty brutal. And this is where the story this is where the story starts to turn and Metallo is beating Superman, you know, to death. He's infected with kryptonite weakened. Um, he's quite gleefully uh, attacking Superman and will kill him and makes it explicitly clear that he will. And this little girl's horrified and she's like, you know, so, so brave and so much in, uh, a Superman fan that she's actually calls Metallo out um, in the middle of the fight. And Superman being Superman, you know, puts everything he's got into a, you know, one last punch. And we got a fun sort of visual gag that's also, you know, kind of chilling and creepy where he knocked his jaw off and then he sort of puts it back on and, uh, gets right back into describing how this kryptonite has turned his own body against him. And now we start to realize, and we'll soon realize that this is actually a bit of a metaphor um, as he describes what it's like to have your body uh, become, to turn against you, to become, you become your own worst enemy. Uh, and in the letter, she's like, but I knew you'd win because you weren't fighting alone and you never give up no matter what. And the Metropolis ICU shows up to uh, aid in Superman. And even if you're scared, even if you're in pain, you never ever give up. And we see that this is this high density uh, lead line foam, the kind that blocks radiation. And Superman, of course, is now rejuvenated, protected from the kryptonite, and Metallo is toast. 
and this is the way it should be. Uh, and this is where Connie says, and that's why you're my favorite superhero. You can do anything you want, but all you want to do is help people. And then um, she reveals that after this day, uh, she got very sick and she's in Metropolis again, it turns out, um, because that's where they have the best doctors and they're taking care of her. But, you know, sometimes there are times it hurts so bad that she can't stop crying. And the worst is when she gets so scared that she can't sleep because I'm afraid I won't be able to wake back up again. And this part of the story came out of, out of uh, an experience that I later had. See, after I wrote this story, uh, when I was 19, I wrote it uh, the summer before I was an intern at, at DC for the first time, shared it with editors there. Uh, the day before my 22nd birthday, I got diagnosed with cancer. Uh, and that was, uh, it was a very weird birthday let's just say that like because I hadn't really told anybody yet and the friends had like set up a birthday party for me they were making all these toasts and it was just weird uh, <laughs> and everyone felt terrible the next day when I finally told everybody um, but I've been there right and so I felt all this too and this story that I'd written I knew that I had written something valuable because I was able to go back to this story and it helped me there was real wisdom here. And uh, we see that Connie is reenacting the battle with action figures in uh, a children's ward. And, you know, everyone's like, so then what happened? It's like, what do you mean? Superman beat the bad guy and saved the day. End of story. And then we hear a voice from off panel, almost, but there's still one last plot there that needs to be tied up. And uh, in arrives Superman. Everyone's pretty astounded. And here we did a pretty neat bit where Superman takes some sand out of a cactus planter and fuses it in the glass with his heat vision, makes a, um, a Superman symbol and grabs a red cloth off of a, um, a chair and makes a cape and makes her into a, a superhero. And, you know, says to, to little Connie, now she's not faster than a speeding bullet and she's not able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Yet no matter what burdens the world puts on her shoulders, she still finds the strength to carry on. She still finds the courage to hope. Her name is Connie and she's my superhero. And, you know, this was a pretty, doubly great thing because I um, I really mean, I think this is a story that especially resonates with children who have been in either one of these positions, the position where they can't help the other person like I was, or the position where they're the sick one and they don't know if they're ever going to be strong again. And to have Superman come down and say, you amaze me. It's a really powerful thing. And I can tell you that I've been uh, to children's hospitals uh, and camps for kids that were dealing with uh, cancer in particular, but often any kind of other chronic childhood disease or serious childhood disease. And I've told them the story and I've listened to their stories. And I can't tell you how much Superman as a character and superheroes in general, but Superman in particular really means to, to kids who are facing something existential like this. It, it gives them strength. Superman gives them power. He helps them fly. And I wanted to make a story that encapsulated that idea. And, you know, that's what this is. And, and I'm really proud of the ender here where Superman floats back out the window, you know, and is talking about all the rules uh, about what it takes to be a superhero. And 
you know, rule number three is you have to be ready to fly off and have adventures at any time of day or night. So are you ready to go? And this is the background on my computer, by the way, um, and has been for about eight years now. Um, and uh, it, this to me, you know, and I've got to write Superman a few times now, but this is the most Superman-y thing that I think I've ever written. Um, and, and I met a lot of people who tell me it's, you know, had a big impact on them. And yeah, it took me, so from the time I wrote this story originally, um, the timeline was I wrote it in college, showed it around at DC. People really liked it, but, you know, didn't know where it would fit in the publishing schedule. And I was still like, I hadn't, you know, hadn't sort of made my bones yet. Uh, I got cancer. Um, <laughs> realized I, this story really was even more powerful than than I thought because it actually spoke to me when I needed it. And it took 15 years from when I wrote it to when it was actually published, almost uh, uh, with 15, 14, 14 years and 11 months from when I wrote it to when it saw publication. Uh, I never gave up on it. And once it got out into the world, I saw it have a real impact on people and kids in particular. And it's been one of the greatest blessings of my entire life uh, was getting to write this story. Um, so yeah, that's Dear Superman. Uh, a very, uh, a very touching story. And I have um, some of the original art from this um, up on my walls at home. Uh, and, and again, the, the girl Connie in there is um, based on my mom. And uh, the one of the splash pages uh, is on her wall at home. So. Very cool. Beautiful. Go ahead. This you mentioned you. It opened the doors for you, DC. What? Let's go ahead as a fan and as a writer and as someone who's been inside. How do you think feel about how the character handled? Well, uh, you know, I mean, the thing about Superman I hope is I didn't super cover the microphone there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I got it. Um, I mean, it's yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the most important thing, and this is true if you care about any uh, fictional character that has been around a while, and it can be Star Wars, it can be uh, the X-Men, um, you know, it can be uh, Firefly, uh, it can be whatever it is, right? It's the work of some person or group of people, but then it typically has become something bigger than that. And, and especially in the case of Superman, Superman's just bigger than anyone who works on the character now, uh, are bigger. Superman will always win is I think the answer. And, and so it almost doesn't matter what DC Comics or Warner Brothers and the film division uh, or any other group is doing with the character in a given moment. Superman is is bigger than all of that and bigger than all of them. And there may be droughts and dry spells where there are times that there aren't a lot of Superman comics out that I may want to read. And that's happened in the past. Um, or there are times where I have, I'm very conflicted about like a, a Superman movie or another work of uh, more mass media. Uh, like, you know, I was very conflicted about like the Man of Steel, for instance, and Batman v Superman. And, but I'm like, you know what? Superman still going to win. Like the, the cycle will just turn. We'll, we'll see another uh, iteration of Superman in 10 years, probably less um, on, on the big screen. And I always have the... Uh, the Christopher Reeve movies, I always have 
the Superman animated series and just the Bruce Timm and Paul Dini Justice uh, League. And then, of course, I've always got, you know, the thousands of comics that I have. So whenever any, <laughs> whenever someone makes like a decision, right, you know, I, I do not agree, for instance, with the uh, Superman uh, unmasking himself as Clark Kent again, you know, because it's a thing that's happened a bunch of times over the years. Uh, it was a mistake when they did it then. It's a mistake to do it now, in my opinion, but they'll always undo it. Like Superman will always be disguised as Clark Kent um, and that will always happen. So at some point they're going to have to undo the story. Uh, I don't know how, I don't know when, but it will happen. Right. So, you know, my POV is uh, just, just be patient. Superman always wins. And uh, often there are, are good stories that come out of even directions and storylines I don't necessarily agree with. So, you know, for me, it's all, it's all just picking and choosing what you, what you love because there's so much of it out there. And I just don't get worked up about all the stuff that I don't because why? <laughs> huh. So when look at it. Any other questions? I don't know. Um, any good stories right. about your time evangelizing comics? You said you had you traveled uh, quite a bit for that. I'm just curious if there's any good stories that came out of that. Yeah, I mean, I so I mean, there's a lot of like uplifting stories where I got to meet with um, artists that uh, were making their own comics in Paraguay and in Chile and Belarus. Um, and got to hopefully give useful advice to them and encouragement about how, how to create, how to tell stories, how to get their stories out there and that they should believe in themselves. Uh, and telling them my story, telling them the stories of other people that have been successful and of action and, you know, functional uh, tools they can use to get out there and make things happen. Um, and I know a number of them actually have successfully self-published and, and gone into their local industries since then. So that always feels really great. Um, certainly the most entertaining story that I have though was when I was in Belarus. And for those of you who don't know, Belarus uh, is a former Soviet Republic and sits between Russia and the Ukraine, or excuse me, Russia, but it's below the Ukraine and it sits between Russia and Poland. And uh, Belarus, when they broke off from the Soviet Union, they were like, well, we want to be our own country, but we still kind of like this whole Soviet system. So we're going to keep a lot of Soviet uh, remnants around, like the KGB. We're going to keep that. <laughs> we're just going to have the Belarusian KGB. And uh, there's a, a lot of conflict uh, diplomatically between the U.S. and Belarus. And recently they had uh, actually expelled America's ambassador and revoked uh, certain diplomatic privileges. And a new ambassador was appointed and you know, all that had been sort of smoothed over the time I got there. But uh, my first day I show up and again, it seems it's a very Soviet looking place uh, with you know, brutalist 70s architecture, these big monumental streets and buildings with giant lights shining up on um, these huge uh, statues of burly uh, working men, like carrying large uh, sacks of things. I don't know what they were supposed to represent, but um, I, I get called in to the office of the security officer for the embassy. And she like pulls the shades and turns the radio up really loud. And she's like, so they still have the KGB here in Belarus. And I was like, yeah, you know, I, I read that in the, in the diplomatic briefing, you get this like packet from the state department before you, you go on any state department missions. Um, and it said all this stuff. And she's like, so 
you're probably going to get bugged or followed while you're here. And I was like, excuse me? And, uh, and they're like, yeah, they're really bad at it, though. So you'll, you'll know. And, and I'm like, hold on. I don't understand. I'm just here to talk about comics, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, but they're going to follow you. And, and um, also, you may be approached by women. And I was like, like what? And it's like, do you know what a honey trap is? And I was like, I yeah, I've seen James Bond. I understand. I what I don't understand is what any of this has to do with me whatsoever. And <laughs> so yeah, basically I was bugged and followed by the KGB in Belarus. And um, to the best of my knowledge, I was not approached by any. Uh, any female agents intent on, on seducing me, <laughs> but you know, maybe, maybe I just, you know, left the bar too fast. I don't know. Um, but yes, that, that's probably my most uh, entertaining uh, ambassador story is getting uh, followed by the KGB. So weren't introduced to any women with very easy names then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I was already dating, as I later learned. I didn't know at the time, but um, my now fiance actually is, her family is from Belarus, um, a couple uh, generations removed. So, I mean, they got to me eventually. It was just a very roundabout way. They did it the hard way, okay. Yeah, you know, they, well, they, really, did, they really put the work in. I got to respect that. And the long game. Ten year long, yeah. Ten year long game. I mean, that's uh, that's dedication. Great story. Yeah. Well, I, I'm. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good. Okay. Um, I'm I'm looking at the time, and they wanted us to keep everything around forty five minutes. Uh, sure thing. But if uh, if anybody wants to check out Reading with Pictures, where do they need to go and um, what are some of the resources they'll find? Well, so readingwithpictures.org is your port of call. And the website has a number of uh, just general resources. Like you can search it and find assets for use in the classroom and any number of direct classroom usage resources. Um, beyond that, uh, you can find our book, uh, Comics to Make Kids Smarter, which, and we promise it will do that. And it's uh, a bunch of really terrific uh, graphic novel, graphic novelists and cartoonists who came together to tell these short stories, each of them tied to different uh, subjects in the uh, Common Core curriculum. So it's actually classroom ready and uh, we've had four book deals actually come out of that one book, uh, including the series called Action Presidents by Fred Van Lente and Ryan Dunlavey, which I very heartily recommend and is hilarious for anyone of any age uh, who wants to know both actual history and the, I guess, the more ridiculous side of actual history when it comes to the fathers of our country. So um, lots of great stuff there. And yeah, uh, if you or anyone you know uh, wants to learn more about using comics in the classroom, start a reading with You can always reach out to me as well. And um, we're always here to help. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time, Josh. Um, I know lots going on. And uh, let me know the next time you're in White County, we'll get together. Grab a DiMaggio's. Yeah. Always, pal. Always. Uh, all right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. And uh, we've got more stuff coming up, I think, uh, this evening. But right now, let's go ahead and um, see what's coming up next. Again, Josh, we'll talk mm -hmm. soon. You know, pal. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.